Lennart Pottering is an incredible German software engineer who started working for Red Hat back in 2008 and over the years has easily become the most hated person in the Linux and maybe the entire FOSS world. And I would argue kind of for no reason, because while he doesn't shy away from a fight and is seemingly convinced that he's always right, leading to a lot of arguments happening, that sort of describes everybody else in the FOSS world as well, whether it's Torvald, Stormen, or anybody else you can think of. The work that he's done over the years has, for the most part, improved the state of Linux, but he hasn't been without some legitimate controversy. And it was discovered a few days ago that you can no longer use Lennart Pottering as a reason to hate Red Hat. So someone tried to contact his Red Hat Bugzilla account about some issues related to Pulse Audio and some Pulse Audio tooling and discovered the account had been disabled. So this guy tried to contact Lenart directly and he had this to say, I haven't done audio stuff for a long time now. I should probably be honest and orphan that stuff in Fedora. Anyone wants to take this over? That said, I've now created a personal Red Hat Bugzilla account and moved the fast stuff over. I'm told that should fix the Bugzilla mess. Let's see. That said, this doesn't mean I'll look into your bug reports. Audio is not my focus anymore. System D is. And why was the account disabled? Well, it turns out that Lennart Pottering is no longer employed at Red Hat. He was attempting to leave the company quietly, but that was never going to happen. He is such a divisive figure and a well-known figure that someone's going to spot it pretty quickly. Now, it's unclear why they parted, but judging by the fact that he still wants to keep working on System D, I'm guessing it wasn't a negative parting. He's probably just wanting to move on to better things in his life. And with a resume like Lennart Pottering's, you could get a job literally anywhere you wanted. So where did he go? Well, he went to a certain blue company. A certain company that creates a competitor to Linux. Lennart Pottering is now employed by Microsoft. Now you don't hire someone like Lennart Pottering and then just turn them into a generic Windows dev. What he's doing is continuing his work on System D. So my guess for why he left Red Hat is Red Hat offered him a sum of money, Microsoft offered him more money, and then he went to the more money. And I can totally respect that if that's what he did. Now, Microsoft isn't exactly the Microsoft of the 90s. Linux is absolutely crucial to their infrastructure for things like Azure, WSL, and distros like CBL Marina. And also, they ensure that things like Hyper-V actually work really well with the Linux kernel. Now, before someone gets it twisted, I'm not saying that I like Microsoft. What I'm saying is they now understand the value they can milk from Linux and from FOSS. And over the years, they've actually hired a lot of notable FOSS developers. People like Guido van Rossman, who created Python, Miguel de Icaza, who created GNOME, and Nat Friedman, to name a few. And I know some people are going to want to drum up the flames of Embrace, Extend, Extinguish. I've already seen plenty of these comments, but from my position, I honestly wish Lennart the best of luck in his new position. So with that out of the way, let's talk about why some people don't like Lennart, because a lot of the time people don't like him, they'll say Lennart bad or any of his projects bad, but won't really expand upon why they don't like it. So Lennart Pottering is the creator and for a long time, one of the maintainers of Pulse Audio. And Pulse Audio for many years at this point has been basically the standard for Linux audio, replacing audio stacks like Open Sound System. Nowadays, Pulse Audio is kind of on the way out with it being replaced by Pipewire, but if I had to guess, I would say that most desktops are still probably using Pulse Audio. And when Pulse Audio was starting to replace Open Sound System, he referred to Open Sound System as a simplistic 90s style audio stack. It doesn't really have any relevance for what you need for a modern desktop, which at the time might have sounded kind of crazy because Open Sound System was doing what most users needed, but over time, absolutely proved to be true. But the main reason for that early Pulse Audio hate, which kind of has stuck around even till today, is that Pulse Audio was deployed absolutely terribly at no fault of Lennart, Red Hat, or any of the developers involved. And Lennart even trashed the deployment. 
So what happened is distros like Ubuntu started adopting Pulse Audio way too early. It was not production ready, it had plenty of bugs still, and it should not have been shipped with distros, along with the fact that a lot of distros started shipping broken configs. Most notably with Ubuntu, where Lennart described his own software as the software that currently breaks your audio, and said Ubuntu didn't exactly do a stellar job, they didn't do their homework. So while there was some complaints made to the distro, ultimately the software took the blame, because the software should be working, the distro are shipping it, a distro wouldn't ship broken software now would they? But that's exactly what had happened. And Pulse Audio nowadays is nothing like it would have been back then. It's not perfect, but no software is ever going to be. But there's still some of that residual hatred there that is probably never going to go away. Lennart is also the creator and one of the maintainers for System D, which basically every distro at this point uses, kind of for good reason. But there is this small subset of distros and small subset of people who don't like System D. And the main concern that I've seen is many describe it as completely disregarding the Unix philosophy, which is commonly described as make programs do one thing and do it well. But that's sort of the SparkNotes version of the Unix philosophy, and a lot of the founders of Unix have differing opinions about the way that Unix should be structured, but I discussed this on my channel a while ago. I'll leave that video linked in the description down below if you want to check it out for yourself. And you may have seen it before, but Lenart posted a 2013 blog post titled The Biggest Myths, basically going over some of the common complaints about System D and explaining whether they are true or not. Things like System D is monolithic, System D is about speed, System D's fast boot up is irrelevant for servers, System D is incompatible with shell scripts, System D is difficult, so on and so forth. How many myths are there actually on here? There's, okay, there's more than I thought there was. There is 30 different things on here. This is very much worth a read, but even just things like System D is monolithic. If you build System D with all configuration options enabled, you'll build 69 individual binaries. These binaries all serve different tasks and are neatly separated for a number of reasons. For example, we designed System D with security in mind, hence most daemons run at minimal privileges, using kernel capabilities for example, and are responsible for very specific tasks only, to minimize their security surface and impact. Also, System D parallelizes the boot more than any prior solution. This parallelization happens by running more processes in parallel, thus it is essential that System D is nicely split up into many binaries and thus processes. In fact, many of these binaries are separated out so nicely they are useful outside of System D too. A package involving 69, nice, individual binaries can hardly be called monolithic. What is different from prior solutions, however, is that we ship more components in a single tarball and maintain them upstream in a single repository with a unified release cycle. I'm not going to read everything here, but I recommend you check it out for yourself. But outside of his software development, he said some things that some people aren't exactly a fan of. One of those things is advocating against the use of POSIX standards, keeping in mind also with the goal of improving the software. So Linux should use its position as a market leader in the market of free Unix-like operating systems and try out some new things. If developers don't force themselves into the constraints of the POSIX API, they could develop some really innovative software like SystemD shows. In fact, the way I see things, the Linux API has been taking the role of the POSIX API and Linux is the focal point of all free software development. Due to that, I can only recommend developers to try to hack with only Linux in mind and experience the freedom and the opportunity this offers you. Get yourself a copy of the Linux programming interface, ignore everything it says about POSIX compatibility, and hack away your amazing Linux software. It's quite relieving which is basically using Linux's position to push around and kind of force the BSDs to be compatible with what we are doing. I can kind of understand this position, considering that most of the FOSS world exists on Linux, but I'm sort of of two minds about this, and I don't know if it's a good idea to completely disregard POSIX. If you've some thoughts about it, let me know down below. And due to this disregard for POSIX, System D is kind of brutally tied to Linux. 
there have been some efforts over the years to port it to the forms of BSD, but System D is designed entirely with Linux in mind, disregarding anything else that might exist. He's also said some things which at the time were kinda controversial, but over the years he's been proven entirely right. For example, back in 2011, calling for something that effectively is the modern Flatpak. The classic Linux distribution scheme is frequently not what end users want. Many users are used to app markets like Android, Windows, or iOS, or Mac have. Markets are a platform that doesn't package, build, or maintain software like distributions, but simply allows users to quickly find and download the software they need with the app vendor responsible for keeping the app updated, secured, and all that on the vendor's release cycle. And even saying something which nowadays everybody and their dog agrees with, but back then wasn't exactly as common of a thought. Linux is still too fragmented and needs to be streamlined. At the time, he was discussing desktop environments, but distros basically have the exact same problem. On the flip side, he did go on sort of an unhinged rant about Linus Torvalds. I'd actually put some blame on a certain circle of folks that play a major role in kernel development. The first and foremost, Linus Torvalds himself. By many, he is considered a role model, but he is quite a bad one. If he posts words like specific folks should be retroactively aborted, who the F does idiotic things like that? How did they not die as babies, considering that they were likely too stupid to find a tit to suck on? Google for it. And that's certainly bad. What Linus said, he's not lying about what Linus said. Linus did absolutely say that, and it wasn't great to say either. But that doesn't make the response at all justified. And you can find plenty of other examples of this online. I'll leave a few of them linked in the description down below. I think that we can all agree that Lenart is a bit of an ass. And as an ass myself, I can respect that. He likes to get into fights, he likes to get into debates. That's cool. What I mainly care about is the work that he has done. And Lenart's work, for the most part, has been good. And while he is a fairly contentious figure, I wish him luck in his future ventures. But let me know your thoughts down below. Do you like Lenart Pottering? Or maybe you think that now that he's working for Microsoft, this spells the absolute doom of Linux, and Linux is going to crumble, is going to be embraced, extended, and extinguished by Microsoft. I would love to know. So if you like this video, remember to go and like the video. If you really like the video and you want to become one of these amazing people over here, go check out my Patreon, subscribe, 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 linked in the description down below. I've got a podcast called Tech Over Tea. I've got a gaming channel called Brody Robinson Plays. That's going to be it for me and I'm out.